Let's find out as today we turn to Romans chapter 7 and verse 2. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, Divorce and Remarriage. Through the Lord Jesus Christ, we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. We thank thee for thy grace and thy faithfulness and the wonderful revelation of thy pursuing love for us. And as we study thy word in this hour, we ask that it may come to many hearts, that we may all recognize afresh how thou hast loved us in spite of our wanderings. We pray thee for the homes of our land, and especially we pray thee for those who have suffered through broken homes. And we ask thee that the truth, as it goes forth in this hour, might aid many in coming closer to thee, and might keep some who have been hurt by false teaching, that they may be restored to thee and may walk before thee in all well-pleasing. Bless the truth to every heart, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our text today continues our study in the opening verses of the seventh chapter of Romans. We have digressed from the doctrinal teaching in order to study incidentally the question of marriage and divorce. Paul used the illustration that a woman is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives, so that if he be dead, she is freed from the law of her husband. We took that verse because of the fact that there is so much difficulty in our country today, so many thousands of broken homes, so many thousands of marriages, divorces and remarriages, that many people are in great, great confusion. At the opening of this series of studies, we stated that this was more than a commentary on the epistle to the Romans, that this was Bible exposition on the whole of the word of God, taking our point of departure from the epistle to the Romans. It is in the light of that fact that we have digressed in order to give the incidental teaching on marriage and divorce, which may be found here. During the last two studies, we have taken this text, the law of her husband, and have shown from the scripture the nature of true marriage and consequently the nature of divorce. We took the story of Hosea, how God through this prophet played a pageant in front of the people, using Hosea to play the part of God himself, while his faithless wife played the part of Israel. The more she was dissolute and wandering, the more Hosea loved her. And this is the picture of our covenant-keeping God. Today, we wish to consider the nature of divorce. Every Bible teacher who goes from place to place teaching the word of God is confronted in almost every city with someone who asks questions about divorce and remarriage. Sometimes the questions are put out of curiosity, sometimes through a desire to confirm one in a judgment of someone else who seems to be in a wrong position, sometimes by someone who has been personally involved and who wishes justification for a position or who wishes light from the Lord's word in deciding a course of action. Some time ago, I wrote an article in our magazine called Divorce and Remarriage, and many of the statements which I am about to make today are taken from that article given at that time. I have not changed my position, and in these years, I have come to much further knowledge on the subject, but I'm quite sure that it can lift the confusion from many minds, can perhaps give comfort to some, and can bring conviction to others. Some time ago in California, I was approached after a meeting and asked my opinion on the divorce matter. I replied that there was no fixed set of rules, and that every case had to be decided according to its own circumstances and particularities. I then received from the questioner a letter which includes the following. In California, he writes, Divorce and remarriage are one of the paramount problems of those both in and out of church. Yet few ministers ever try, or perhaps dare, to teach anything on the subject, and much confusion and misunderstanding reign. It is surprising the number of church members sometimes even church workers, officers, ministers, who are divorced, perhaps remarried, here in Southern California. The friend who was with me that Sunday is a Christian worker in a Mexican mission and is confronted with this problem to an even greater degree than our workers among white people. Their marriage relations are perhaps more mixed up than even those of the movie colony. As much evil can be caused by giving advice more harsh than is exacted of God as can be by being too lenient. And the letter then continues, as these problems are varied in their nature, 
it would be difficult to state a specific case, as you suggested. What we both would appreciate is a clear, intelligent understanding of the scriptural teaching on the subject that will solve all cases. From the experience in a ministry that is now becoming long, I can say that here lies the difficulty. It is totally impossible, from what knowledge we have of the Word of God, to give a teaching that will solve all cases, as my friend asks. The reason for this is that not all cases fall under the same category, and therefore it is impossible to answer them all in the same fashion. Regulations on divorce were given, first of all, to the children of Israel. And when the Lord Jesus Christ came to this earth, he found the people that had departed from God. In departing from God, they had departed from moral standards. The first passage to consider is the fifth chapter of the Gospel of Mark and its parallel passages. The Pharisees put a test to Christ, asking him if it were lawful for a man to divorce his wife. Christ replied, asking them what Moses had commanded. They answered that Moses had granted permission for a man to write a bill of divorce to put away his wife. The Lord Jesus replied in a verse which needs careful consideration. He stated that Moses had been permitted by God to give them such a precept because of the hardness of heart, but that in the beginning of the creation when God created Adam and Eve, he made them to be one flesh. Now since Christ was dealing with the Pharisees, it was necessary, therefore, for him to present once more and establish the original principle as it had been set forth by God for a perfect creation. And so Christ said, Therefore, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now I believe that this passage shows that a divine principle had been established, which, if man had remained perfect, if man had remained perfect, would have continued without difficulty. Every man would have loved his own mate and would never have turned his eyes elsewhere. There never would have been a question of separation or divorce. But man fell. And God, while he never compromises, is of course practical in his dealings with men. He knoweth our frame. He remembereth that we are dust. There came to be times, therefore, that God permitted that a bill of divorcement should be granted. One phrase in the Sermon on the Mount, for example, adds further light to this. Christ said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. Now this certainly modifies the categorical statement of Mark, adding further light, namely, that under the law, it is permissible for a man to put away his sinning wife. The same qualification is made in the passage recorded later in the same gospel in Matthew 19.9. Now, at this point, it should be recalled that we are still dealing with those who are under the Old Testament law and are not yet considering the matter from the point of view of the church. And by the church, I mean the organism of true believers, not the organization. There is an inference in Matthew 5.32 that the putting away of the wife causes her to commit adultery. Some might argue that this is not so, as the putting away is not the sin, but the remarriage is the sin. And if the woman who had been put away remained alone, she would not be in sin. I wonder if God did not realize how frail and weak his creatures were, to the point of saying that the separation in the vast majority of cases would cause a rejoining elsewhere, which would be a sinful union. I remember reading that one of the early patristic writers said that since Christ did not specifically say so, that it was no sin for a man who had left his wife to go out into what Christians call an illicit union. But the terms of Christ's statement, of course, are generic. When he says, if a man, he means a member of the human race, and it applies to the woman as well as the man. And that which is spoken to the man and his attitude toward the women refer just as strongly when the positions are reversed. Clearly, the Bible teaches that it is the remarriage which is sin and not the divorce necessarily. The inference is that the divorce leads almost inevitably to sin. Now, I know of some Christians who look upon these passages in the Bible as being final. That is, they would apply them to every member of the human race. I believe, however, that they have failed to understand the position of the epistles in relation to the gospel. Christ said to his disciples in John 16, 12 and 13, I have many things to say to you, but you are not able to bear them now. Howbeit, 
When he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. And we know that after Pentecost, there were changed provisions concerning eating and drinking, fellowshipping with Gentiles, intermarriage between Jew and Gentile, and many other points. Now, is there also a post-Pentecostal elaboration of the doctrine of divorce and remarriage? Before we go to the epistles, however, it's necessary to enlarge on one point. Christ said, What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Now the California correspondent asks this, quote, Does this imply that a marriage in which God has not done the joining can be completely dissolved with the two parties being free to marry again if they choose? And how is one to determine whether God has or has not joined the parties involved? And that's the end of the letter. Now I'm quite aware that many will disagree with me on what I am about to say, but I do believe the entire spirit of the scripture's teaching on marriage indicates that God has nothing to do with the unsaved world and that all of their actions are apart from him. No matter how fine and upright their character, a couple who are united in what the world calls marriage are certainly not united in what God calls marriage. Now, a true marriage, as we have seen, is a symbol of Christ and the church. We therefore leave entirely out of our consideration everything in connection with those who are unsaved. Let me give an example. Many years ago, a young man was definitely and thoroughly saved under my preaching. I saw him from time to time, and I knew of his growth in Christ. Some three years later, he came to me and asked if he had the right to remarry. I had not even known that he had been married in the first place. The story was a common one. He, an unsaved man, married an unsaved girl. She wanted the right to give up her job, stay at home, have a fur coat, go to the movies in the afternoon, or play bridge with her friends. A year passed by and the glamour of it wore off and she, she went home to mother. In another year, he received notification from the courts that she had sued him for divorce on the usual grounds that are recorded in such cases. In some instances, incompatibility, or in others, cruel and barbarous treatment or desertion. The young man was sick of the whole matter. He ripped the paper into pieces and threw it in the wastebasket and let the matter go by default. A year or two more had passed before he was saved. And then, three years later, he was speaking to me about it. At the time, I was beginning my ministry, and I was treading very lightly on questionable matters. I wrote letters to a dozen of the outstanding ministers and Bible teachers of the country. I put the matter before them, and I asked if this young man had a right to be remarried. The replies showed that unanimously they believed that he did have such a right. I had been of this opinion myself, but I wanted older advice. To someone who disagreed and said that the young man did not have a right to remarry, I put the simple question. Suppose he had lived with this woman for a year without a marriage ceremony. Would he have a right to marry now that he's saved? The answer was, of course, that he most certainly would. Well, I continued, but suppose he had committed fornication with a dozen women over the course of two or three years of unsaved life and then had been saved. Would he now have the right to marry? And again, the answer was that he most certainly would. At the time a man is born again, his whole past is blotted out. Well, suppose he had lived with 12 women on occasions and had had a marriage ceremony performed in one case. Would that marriage ceremony invalidate the possibility of a further marriage? Why, a mere statement of the proposition shows the folly of such a conclusion. Clearly, the young man had never been joined in the Lord to anyone. Now, as a saved man, he wished to marry a Christian young woman whom he had met at least two years after his salvation. And they were soon joined in Christian marriage, and they have been maintaining a fine Christian home throughout the years. It would be my judgment, therefore, that true regeneration taking place at any time, blots out all that goes before and leaves the new creature in Christ Jesus with a new life, clean and fresh, as God will open the way. Another phase of this subject involves the cases on individuals who are born again after their marriage and who find themselves coupled to an unsaved partner. The early Corinthian church was composed, we have reason to believe, in large proportion of such unions. Here the word of God speaks categorically. If a woman is saved at a moment when she is already married to an unsaved man, 
she is not to depart from her husband. We read in 1 Corinthians 7.10. But the very next line adds, but and if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. The following line also reverses the case when the believer is the husband and the unbeliever is the wife. The phrase, but and if she depart, shows that God definitely recognizes a contingency when departure may be necessary. Suppose, for example, a woman is married to a drunken brute. She is not saved, nor is he. And then she is born again. He threatens her life. Is she to stay with him and be killed? And to allow the children to be killed? Clearly, the Bible indicates that she is to leave him. Subsequently, however, she shall either return to him or remain away, but unmarried. The Lord then goes on to say in verse 12 or 13 that if any man or woman is saved at a time when he or she is joined to a non-Christian mate, the Christian is not to seek any separation. The believing husband is not to put away the non-Christian wife so long as she is content to dwell with him. The believing wife is not to leave the unbelieving husband if he finds his pleasure in remaining married to her. It would appear that God is telling people who find themselves in such cases that they are to remain as witnesses showing before the world the possibility of a Christian living in any circumstance and maintaining a life of consistent joy and victory drawn from the Lord and not from the springs of earthly joys. I recently had the occasion to tell a Christian woman whose husband had left her that what had happened was simply this. She had taken him for better or for worse, and she had gotten the worse, and that to the honor and glory of the Lord, she should live with her problem as a witness for Christ. Indeed, in such instances, God even tells us that the children born of such a union of one Christian parent and one non-Christian parent, where the marriage took place before the regeneration of one parent, that the children are in God's elective plan, and in due time God will bring them to salvation, even as he has brought the believing parent. For this is what verse 14 teaches. The unbelieving husband or wife is sanctified by the believing, mate, else were your children unclean, but now they are holy. Now the Lord then takes up following this, the case of a definite Christian, who, saved after marriage, is joined to a mate who is not a Christian, and does not want to live with a Christian. Another illustration comes out of my ministry. Mr. A was definitely born again. His wife, Mrs. A, refused Christ. She would have nothing to do with the church, forced him to do all the care for the children on Sunday morning, dress and take them to Sunday school. She refused to go. Finally, she left her husband. Work took him to another city. He pled with her for the sake of the children to return to him. And this she did, living under his roof, but not with him. When the youngest child was married at a very young age, the wife then said that there was no further use of her staying and abandoned the husband again. She testified to her hatred of Christ and Christianity and in no uncertain terms, stated the grounds of her desertion was the life of her husband. She wanted a man of the world. The man, then approaching middle age, came to his pastor and the official board of his church and asked if he had the right to remarry. It was ascertained that the woman whom he had now learned to love had been unknown to him throughout the period of his married life. There was no question whatsoever of the entrance of a second woman to destroy the first marriage. It was clearly a case of 1 Corinthians 7.15 where the unbelieving wife was not pleased to dwell with the believing husband. The scripture states definitely, quote, but if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or sister is not under bondage in such cases, but God has called us to peace. On the basis of this teaching, it was ruled that the man had a right to remarry in the Lord and establish the companionship of a Christian home. Now there are further questions which arise, and I bring them up out of my actual experience with people during my ministry. There's the case of Mrs. B, who is a believer, married to Mr. B, an unbeliever. Mr. B is very eager that Mrs. B maintain his home, mother his children, and provide the cover of his reputation. But Mr. B takes another woman on weekend trips. Does this give Mrs. B the privilege of divorcing her husband and remarrying? This case was answered in the negative. She has no such privilege, since God says she was to remain with her husband. There would be no point to 1 Corinthians 7.13 if such were not the case. For the Bible says, And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Now it is not to be generally expected that an unsaved man will act in any other than an adulterous fashion. 
he does not have the life of God in him. His wife, therefore, is bound to her husband as long as he is content to dwell with her. Someone would immediately ask if this would be so if the case were reversed. I know a definite case. Mr. C, I will call him, became a Christian after his marriage. His wife was a flirtatious woman, and the husband had the definite evidence of her adultery in at least three instances with two different men. He was advised on the basis of this Corinthian passage to tell her that he would forgive her seventy times seven because he represents God to her, and that he was acting under the phrase, How knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? Now, in this case, the salvation was not long in coming. The weak woman began to attend meetings with her husband. I talked with her. The home was reestablished. And though she is a veritable babe in Christ, I believe that she is in Christ. Now, the question is raised by the California correspondent whom I quoted at the beginning. Is it possible for two believers to be joined together, but not by God? Does the fact that there is no fellowship in the marriage indicate that they are unequally yoked, even though both parties make a profession of being Christian? Now, there's no doubt of the fact that a believer may get out of the will of God and marry another believer also out of the will of God. If they come to the place where they come back into the will of God, they must dwell together and show before the world what Christ can do in cementing lives and making the best possible out of the mistakes of the past. It can readily be seen that if a strong position were not taken in this way, a Christian could say at any time, well, I believe that I was out of the will of God when I married my wife. We have no fellowship together, so we're separating. Ah, in 99% of such cases, the one who made such a statement would be marrying someone else within a few weeks after the divorce, and it would be someone else upon whom his eye had been resting during the first marriage. True fellowship with the Lord will make fellowship between any believing husband and wife. It would be possible to go on with many different cases, because the ramifications of human behavior and misbehavior are so great that the mixtures are unending and each one would have to be dealt with in a different way. We'll go on with this message, going back to the teaching of Romans on our freedom from the law and our marriage to Christ in grace. And our God and Father, we pray thee that the Holy Spirit shall bless this to each heart and use it to thine honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.